Welcome to the Byte Radar podcast. I'm George Scott, editor in chief of Byte Radar, and today is another one of our Meets episodes. Today, we've got a chat with EF Education Nippo rider Lachlan Morton. If you're not familiar, Lachlan has thrown himself into EF's alternative calendar over the past few years, not only competing on the road as a pro, but trying his hands at some of the world's toughest bikepacking, gravel, and mountain bike events. Now, Lachlan isn't riding the Tour de France, but he is, to put it mildly, very busy throughout July. Lachlan is riding the Orc Tour, an event devised by the Australian, his team and his sponsors, whereby he's riding the Tour de France route ahead of the race with the aim of beating the peloton to Paris. Lachlan started his ride on the same day the Tour left Brittany, but not only is he riding the full route, he's also riding every transfer in between, including the final 700km transfer to Paris. That's an extra 2,400km of riding on top of the 3,414km already served up by the Tour de France route. It's 23 days straight, regularly spending more than 12 hours and 300 kilometers a day in the saddle. All unsupported. No peloton, no team cars, no mechanics, with all of his gear on his bike, sourcing food and camping as he goes. I caught up with Lachlan at the end of day 10 in a small town in the south of France. At that point, he had covered the first 12 stages to give himself an 850 kilometer advantage over the peloton. Lachlan is riding in support of World Bicycle Relief. If you are able to donate, you can do so via the Alt Tour website. More than £200,000 has been pledged so far, which in turn will see more than 1,700 bikes donated to those who need them most. I'm sure you'll agree this is one hell of a ride in more ways than one. So that's the intro done. Let's get on with the podcast. Uh, hello, Lachlan, and uh, welcome to the Bike Radar podcast. Thank you for taking the time to join us midway through your ride. Um, well, first of all, can you tell us where you're speaking to us from at the moment? Um, I'm just past Nantes in a small town uh, that I can't remember the name of. Um, just in the, I'm in a campsite, uh, sat on the ground, and I'm just eating dinner. I mean, let's kind of let's kick things off by running through some of the numbers of your ride so far. Um, so you've just come to the end of your tenth day of riding. You passed the halfway point. So, yeah, I've been watching your dot carefully. So far, you've ridden 3,049 kilometers. That leaves 2,461 to go to take you up to the full distance of just over 5,500 kilometers. So far, you've spent 123 hours riding. You've climbed over 36,000 meters, and your average speed is just under 25 kilometers an hour. And finally, I should definitely say, by this point, you've raised more than 200,000 pounds for World Bicycle Relief. So, you know, those numbers are mind boggling. So the first question I need to ask is, how are you feeling? I feel pretty good, all things considered. The body's held together pretty well. I had some issues like early on with my knee. and um, My feet are like a uh, small issue. But no, I mean, I can't really complain. Like, I don't know. I feel like I've just ridden myself into it. My body's slowly getting used to it, which is nice. Yeah, you mentioned there that the problems you had in, uh, with your knee, um, and, and of course, I mean we've we've all seen the pictures of you, of you riding in um, in sandals in the Alps or coming up to the Alps. But you, you're back in your regular cycling shoes now, is that right? No, I'm in the sandals again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I've just been riding. I kind of like I like the sandals now. Um, I because I've had so much rain. Well, it's been every day except for maybe two or three. I've been rained on, um, and so just like wet feet. I was getting a bit of like trench foot. Um, so I've just been in the sandals just to air them out. But yeah, I don't know. They're just growing on me. I just kind of like running. So, you know, you're past the Alps now. You're past Von 2. Um, you know, the first yeah. week of the race was kind of relatively flat or, or rolling. Um, you know, how did things change for you when you did head into the high mountains? Um, it's just very slow going because um, I have quite a lot of stuff. Um, being like three weeks, I didn't want to like skimp on, you know, the sleep equipment and like cooking stuff because ultimately it's like if you if you try and go too light, um, you're just going to be uncomfortable and it's too long to be uncomfortable. So I, I, I've got a pretty heavy bike and it just means once it gets over like 5%, it's kind of the sweet spot. Once it's beyond that, it's just, you you know, down to your smallest gear almost and just um, riding more or less as hard as you can just to just to keep a decent speed. So it's just, it, it's like a, you just have to change your mindset of what you're normally used to doing, you know, and mm. things, things just take like 
take much longer. Like a 10K climb becomes what would normally be like a 15K climb. At least like in the mountains you have like the scenery, you know, so it makes it all more manageable. Mm. I mean, how was how was the double ascent of Von 2 on a, on a bike packing rig? Because you know, the, the first the first way up the, the climb is the, the easier way of the three, but the second ascent, you know, the classic Tour de France ascent is... Yeah, that's bloody steep, particularly that first kind of opening 10 kilometers through the forest. Yeah, I I had a, I'd honestly, I'd, I'd thought about it tactically when I was there um, for the challenge of Von 2. I ended up camping at the bottom. So I did the first, first like pass yesterday afternoon or night, camped down the bottom. And then this morning I just woke up and left my tent and that set up and then whipped a quick lap. And then pick my gear up on the way out. So the second second ascent, I was only half loaded, I guess, which felt like amazing. I felt like I had wings. <laughs> yeah, after kind of more than two two thousand kilometers in the saddle and, and kind of shifting that yeah. weight off your bike, I, that's I, a big I, change. Actually, I instantly regretted it though because when I when I it was a it was a pain to get everything back on, and then when I realised again what it felt like to have such a heavy bike, I couldn't believe it. You know, I was like, surely what? I was like, what else did I put in here? I was um, I was going to ask you what's been the, the biggest challenge so far. I mean, it sounds like the weather's been pretty horrendous for you. Yeah, um, just being wet is has been an issue. Like you know, setting up camp takes twice as long as you got to try and dry everything, um, and just you know, the, like rain is generally a downer. So trying to stay positive through that um, has taken like quite a bit of energy, um, and. I don't know. That's a, I had one one rough night when I couldn't get food, and I ended up going like I don't know fourteen or fifteen hours without food because I had to sleep. And that was in the Alps, um, so I had to sleep without food and then ride sixty or seventy k the next morning till I could get food. Um, it was more or less my own fault, <laughs> but um, it was just a, made it a rough night. You know, my mindset is just to see it as challenges, not negatives. You know. Um, and every day there there is a challenge. And you always think like this time of the night, like when you're finished for the day and you're having something to eat and sending out the camp, you're like, ah, oh, tomorrow's gonna be easier. You know, you're like it's three hundred K, but uh, I'm gonna do it's only three thousand meters of climbing, you know. But there's always gonna be a challenge. Um and once you accept that like there's some hard moment every day, then it just it, it's easier. For me, if I just view it as like a, a challenge to overcome and ultimately it becomes a positive, so I don't, I don't have too many negatives. I mean, have you, um, have you kind of got an idea in your head as to, you know, what kind of head start you need for that final 700 kilometre transfer to Paris? Uh, it's probably like a day's worth of riding. I mean, 24 hours worth of riding. So if you break that down, you need at least probably two days. Um, if you don't want to do anything stupid, <laughs> which I preferably don't want to. Um, yeah, a couple of days, I think, is what you really need. Um, but also, like, that's assuming nothing goes wrong, you know? And, like, even yesterday, I spent, like, three hours on the side of the road. With, uh, not three hours. I, uh, I spent, like, an hour on the side of the road because I'd run out of tubes and, like, ended up patching my tubes with, like, a mattress repair kit that I had and like you know and if I'd got one more flat I would have been in big trouble um but I found a bike shop so like things can happen pretty quick so yeah, there's, it's hard to know exactly how much time you would need um with all the things that can go wrong I mean it, it kind of looks kind of looking at your schedule and where you are you know you're a couple of days ahead of the race or a few days ahead of the race but you know there's obviously yeah. a lot of riding to come is there any kind of part of the yeah. route or part of the ride that you know, not necessarily scares you, but you, you know, there's kind of a question mark over it at this point. Um, I think the the run through the Pyrenees is very difficult. Um, like I know a lot of those climbs, I know those areas, and it's just hard going. And it's going to be different than doing it in the Alps because um, you, you have the extra fatigue already. Um, so. You're kind of getting into that stage where your body's really breaking down, and then the course is also going to get more difficult. It's hard to 
know how you're going to react, um, but there's definitely the potential for a meltdown somewhere there in the mountains. Mm. Um, but you just have to take it each day as it comes. Well, not even each day. It's more. It's more like take each hour as it comes, and then deal with that hour as best you can, um, and then see see where you're at. You know, because you have such huge dips and like spikes and um, it's like a bit of an emotional roller coaster when you do something like this. So uh, if you get too far ahead of yourself, um, you can you can do yourself in like mentally. Mm, absolutely. I mean, we've, we've seen quite a lot of pictures that have kind of fed back to us from, from you out on the road and, you know, it kind of looks like occasionally you've had, um, you know, certainly lots of support out on the road, and people kind of join you at certain times. And what has the the response been like from the public that you have come across? Yeah, it's been great. Um, I've had heaps of people come out and ride, um, which is nice, you know, um, to be able to like share some kilometres with a few different people. And generally, they're local to the area, so they can tell you a few things about where you are, um, which is really nice. Um, and yeah, just generally meeting people who are enthusiastic about cycling. It's like motivating. Um, uh, it's just amazing to have people come out and like appreciate what you're doing because ultimately I'm just doing something I really like to do. Um, and to have people like, you know, be stoked about that, um, that's about as good as it gets. I mean, you're, you're clearly someone that's not afraid of a, a challenge and, and kind of taken on the alternative calendar as you have done with GB Juro, Unbound, Leopard 100. Um, yeah. Would Would you say this is the biggest challenge to date? Yeah, 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 certainly. Um, just the duration of like, hey, it's it's two weeks, three weeks long. So, um, and B, like each day is just so long. Um, so it's hard to like you, but you basically go into that like um, deep, like dark zone every day. <laughs> just day in day out and every day you clip in you know at some point you're going to get back there um which is just a huge challenge in itself so more or less feels like you're doing kind of like a uh unbound sort of style effort each day i guess yeah it's a big challenge it's the biggest i've done and um we'll only keep you for a couple more minutes because clearly you need to kind of uh you know recover and um get something to eat and get ready for tomorrow but I just wanted to ask you quickly about um your bike and your setup because you, you mentioned it earlier um so am I right in saying that you're riding your team issue Canada Super 6 Evo yeah yeah it's my spare race bike I believe is there anything that you've kind of changed significantly whether it's kind of any hacks or mods that you've done um for the ride kind of beyond the the kind of bike packing bags and the kind of kit that you've added yeah I'm running a different bar so I could put some clip-ons on um I generally use the the integrator bar, but I'm using like a, a stem um, with the 4D bar, um, so I could just put the clip-ons on. And then I just run the the pads straight onto the flat bar, um, just because I find it a more comfortable position. Um, outside of that, I got flat pedals on it, which is pretty sick. Mm. Um, <laughs> The the bag, I had the frame bag made um, by a girl in Utah, um, which was like to the specifications of the frame, which was great. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I've got pretty small gearing. I've got like a 34, uh, 32, um, just because of the weight of the bike. And you use it quite a lot. But yeah, I don't know. Outside of that, I've got like a whole bunch of tubes that I tie around my bag so I can dry my clothes as I go. I call it the clothesline. Um, I mean, how how does the bike or what does the bike weigh compared to your uh, you know regular race bike setup? I haven't weighed it, um, but I'm going to try and weigh it on the way here because it feels like it's it's definitely getting up towards 20 kilos. That um, sort of feels like I don't know because I've got like a bladder in there plus another bottle um cool sleep system cooking clothes spares um so it all adds up to a pretty significant amount of weight um, yeah. and then you put food on so yes yeah, interesting you mentioned food there and you, you, know, you mentioned it before in 
uh, yeah, in terms of that night where you, you couldn't get hold of any food. I mean, uh, I can imagine your kind of nutrition regime is quite different to, you know, what it is in, in the regular race season. Yeah, I'm just sucking back a liter of cider right now. And I've got <laughs> uh, some prosciutto and uh, a melon because that seemed like a good thing after a hot day. Uh, and then I got uh, anchovy dip because I thought it was artichoke dip, um, which is pretty rough, but I'm going to have to eat it with some chips. So basically whatever I can get my hands on easy. And, uh, you know, just, just last question. Um, you know, you sound in good spirits. You sound like you're going well. Um, you know, we've got kind of full confidence that you're going to make it to Paris. So, you know, once you do have those five and a half thousand kilometers um, under your belt, what, what will be the first thing you do when you get to Paris? Um, just do nothing. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm hoping my wife can make it there. And the, the idea of like getting into a nice hotel bed, um, and just doing nothing for a few days sounds like it's just the nicest thing. I mean, is, um, you know, yeah, is a kind of good bed at the end of a hard day. Is that the, the, the one thing that you just can't replicate out on the road like you are at the moment? Yeah, basically. Like at the end of the day, you're on the ground. <laughs> like you can try and jazz it up as many ways as you want, but at the end, you just sleep on the ground. So um, it will be nice to get elevated and on a mattress. Well, hopefully you can find yourself a nice, uh, comfortable bed as, as soon as possible. Um, but we'll, we'll leave it there. I know you need to well, you need to get back to your cider for the for a start and your prosciutto. Um, but yeah, clearly yeah. to kind of recover and uh, yeah, get a good night's sleep before tomorrow. Um, so yeah, really, really appreciate your time and, um, yeah, we'll be back in you all the way and, and, uh, yeah, it's been a great to, to follow your story and it's a real, a real pleasure to speak to you. Nice one. Thanks brother. Cheers. Bye-bye.